about two and a half or so years ago, we added climate change to our portfolio, if you will, because we were finding that teachers were getting beat up for teaching uh, climate change in similarly to how they were being uh, discouraged from teaching evolution. And we began to notice the parallels in these two, um, two movements and how it was affecting science education. And we thought that maybe some of the experience that we had uh, gained over the years in dealing with the evolution issue, we might be able to apply to the climate science issue as well. Could you describe some of the ways that evolution denial uh, parallels climate denial? Yeah, there are a number of parallels, but there also are some very distinct differences between the two. Um, sort of the, the 20,000 foot level, if you go back and you look at these two uh, controversies, the main similarity is that it's really not about the science. I mean, people do not show up at school board meetings and wait there behind a microphone for hours to speak for three minutes because they really feel passionate about the Cambrian explosion or because they feel passionate about the uh, differential between the uh, land temperature and ocean temperature. I mean, th this is not what really motivates people. What motivates people to uh, fight against climate change or evolution is some sort of ideological or emotional um, uh, concomitant to this controversy. In the case of evolution, the ideology, of course, is religion. Uh, people of particular Christian views, uh, and of course in Great Britain it's, it's Muslims, but people of certain uh, conservative, religiously conservative Christian views don't want their kids to be taught evolution because it has consequences for their religious views. People of certain political or economic ideologies don't want their kids to be taught climate change because the, you know, climate change has consequences for their particular ideological views. So it's really not about the science, it's really about the ideology. Are there um, similar tactics that the two different types of denial employ? That was the f one of the first things one of the first things that we noticed about parallels between the anti-evolution and anti-climate change movements was tactics. Because the, uh, the first tactic, of course, is to attack the science. The science of evolution is weak. The science of, cl of uh, global warming is weak. Therefore, you c we can reject them. The second thing that we noticed about the parallels between evolution and climate change is that it's not so much the science as the consequences of the science for the particular ideology. Conservative Christians believe that if evolution is true, then the Bible is false, there is no God, uh, there is no salvation, you will not be reunited with God at the end times. And these are very, very important issues. Children will not have a moral rudder to guide them. You know, there are very, very important issues uh, at stake if evolution is true. In the case of climate change, where it's more of a political ideology and or an economic ideology, the concerns are more along the lines of, well, if climate change is true, that means that we're going to have to strengthen central government because we're going to have to take steps to curb uh, uh, the carbon production so that we can reduce the amount of CO2 in the air. That means a bigger central government. As political conservatives, we don't want a big we don't want a big central government. It means we're going to have to put some constraints on capitalism, that socialism. So there's a lot of things that political conservatives are going to lose also if climate change is right. Another parallel between the evolution and the uh, climate change controversies is that the consequences for the idea ideology are stressed. So the ideologues on both sides frame the top, frame the controversy in terms of you've got to choose. Uh, you either are a good guy, Christian creationist, or you're a bad guy, uh, atheist evolutionist. There's a line in the sand and it's a, they dichotomize the issue. In the case of climate change, it's another dichotomy. It's a different dichotomy, but it's still a dichotomy. You're either a good guy, conservative, um, um, capitalist uh, who rejects climate change or you're a bad guy socialist uh, liberal uh, who accepts climate change. So people hearing these messages, if they are politically conservative, well naturally I've got to you know, take this point of view, otherwise I'm not being true to my, to my values. 
Similarly, people who are religiously conservatives, well, I have to take this value because otherwise I'm not being true to my values. So there, are, th th there definitely are non-scientific issues that you have to deal with in this issue, in, in dealing with these controversies. Let me put it this way. In working with the evolution issue, we found that the best way to get somebody to accept the science is to have a message delivered by somebody that they trust that will assuage their fears that they have to choose between faith and science. And so evangelicals who accept evolution are the best ambassadors to the conservative religious community because they're the ones who have the same ideological view, but they also accept the science. So that sets up a, a, um, a clash, so to speak, that you don't expect this, so tell me more. Uh, and similarly with the climate change issue, you have the message that climate change is real, we have to deal with it, let's talk about what sort of policies we can institute, have that message delivered by somebody who is from the same ideological background, somebody who is politically conservative, somebody who uh, is not a socialist. Um, there aren't that many socialists in the United States to start with anyway. Uh, but you know, libertarian and politically conservative views can, can be packaged in a way, shall we say, that allows somebody from that ideological tradition to listen to the science. Now, we feel that both the science of evolution and the science of climate change are strong enough so that if a person can listen to them without the ideological fingers in the ears, so to speak, that the science is going to be persuasive. But you've got to get the fingers out of the ears before the science has a chance to work.